service. I pray your blessing over Ron as he comes forth and delivers your message, Lord, because I feel like you got something to say, Lord. And I just thank you for each and every person that is here today, and I just pray that they leave feeling you. And Lord, I just pray that you just be with us, and I ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.
Well, good morning. Good morning. Debbie done said hello to everybody, but I say hello again. <laughs> Glad to see everybody out on this beautiful day out there. You know, I get aggravated these news, these weather reporters, because first thing he said this morning, well, winter's here. I hate to break it to them, winter's been here for a while. <laughs> Why can't they just enjoy them beautiful days that we have? You know, if I had my druthers, I'd rather be 70 degrees. You know, I'm, I'm like baby bear. 75. 75. I like it just right. That fishing weather, yeah. That's like Elsie says that I'm a big baby. Says she had to finish raising me. But between me and you, she still got a job to do. So <laughs> I still take a lot of raising. So anyway, but I do like the pretty warm weather, and I, I don't like cold. These old bones hurt. We know. <laughs> Today, my sermon is going to call "Come and See." Our scripture is going to come through one John 1, 29 through 42. In Isaiah 49, 1 through 7, God speaks his promise over his people and inviting them to come and see the adventures of obedience. In Psalms 40, 1 through 11, the author invites us to come and see in the glory and deliverance of God through telling his own experience. In 1 Corinthians 1, 1 through 9, Paul invites the young church to embrace their identity and their inheritance in Christ. In John 1, 29 through 42, Jesus gets his first disciple, Andrew, with the invitation, come and see. Andrew dedicates his life and extends that invitation to the world. Andrew, the shadow disciple. As I said, our sermon's going to come from there. Can anybody tell me who Donald Trump's sister is? Marianne. How about Oprah Winfrey's half-sister? Patricia Lee. Can anybody name the other four members of the Jackson Five? I can't neither. I can't neither. Uh, I'd like to play a little video right now. If, if uh, we can get it to play, I... I had a hard time with this, and I think I aggravated Mike trying to download this, so we'll see. St. Andrew was born the son of Jonah, early in the first century in Bethsaida, along the Sea of Galilee. He made his living as many of the other apostles had. He was a fisherman. St. Andrew initially was a disciple of St. John the Baptist, however, while walking one day with his friend, St. John said to him, Behold the Lamb of God. St. Andrew immediately recognized Jesus as the Messiah. He joined Jesus as the first apostle and went to get his brother, Simon Peter, to introduce him to his new friend, Jesus the Christ. St. Andrew was a close friend to Jesus and was part of the inner circle of the apostles and they lived together in Capernaum during the public life of Jesus. As one of Christ's closest confidants, St. Andrew was present at most of the crucial events in the public life of his Lord. During the miracle of the feeding of the multitudes, it was St. Andrew who said to Jesus, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fishes, but what are they among so many? Therefore, able to witness our Lord blessing the loaves, lifting them up to his Holy Father, and feeding the throngs of people who had come to listen, learn, and worship their Messiah. St. Andrew was seated near Jesus at the Last Supper, witnessing the celebration of the First Eucharist. He suffered through the crucifixion of our Lord and celebrated his resurrection after three days in the tomb. St. Andrew followed the directives of the Lord to go and teach all nations, bringing the gospel to Greece, the Ukraine, and Russia. He was claimed by the Byzantine church as the first bishop and is the patron saint of Russia, Scotland, and Greece. As with many of the apostles, St. Andrew the apostle was martyred. 
Says Andrew, felt unworthy to be crucified in the same manner of Jesus Christ, he requested to be tied, not nailed, to the cross, only in the shape of an X, now called the St. Andrew Cross. He died on November 30th during the reign of Nero in Patrice, Greece. He celebrated his feast on November 30th. So we got a little bit of idea who Peter or who Andrew is. Who is Peter's brother, Andrew? He is in the shadows throughout. We know very little about him. We don't know of very many miracles that he worked. And there's very little recorded history between him and Jesus. One of the things that we do name, know was his name. He come on the scene, but his famous brother, Simon, which was a solid Aramaic Hebrew name, was a good Jewish boy who was carrying out his parents' dreams of doing something. And Andrew was the young one that come along, Peter's younger brother. And he was given a Greek name, Andrew, which translates to manly or brave. But this strong, silent man never does make it out of the shadows of Peter, his brother. He first comes on the scene in John 1, 35 to 42. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. Then he saw Jesus passing by. He said, look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was the one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will, you will be called Cephas, which means in translation, Peter. So right there, we get some kind of a detail of who, go back, who Andrew was. He was one of John the Baptist's disciples. It, John the Baptist was this big poetic voice during old tradition of prophecy in the Old Testament where he was calling for revival and renewal of God's people. He was in the ancient society. He had this big poetic voice that people would follow him. He had gained a quite big following. You know, it wasn't unheard of in a spiritual time like that for someone like John the Baptist to have followers. They came from where he lived and where he worked. They followed him in the same manner that they would end up following Jesus. But John the Baptist had a different message than just calling for renewal. He was calling for something new. He was telling them to pay close attention because there was something new. He didn't know exactly where the direction was coming from or what it was, but he knew that something new was going to take place. Amen. Amen. And we see the first of the calling, by no means the famous, was Andrew, Peter the Rock's little brother. As the 12 apostles scattered to the four corners of the earth, and, most, and Andrew went to Greece where the biggest part of them went, he was there, and we have very little record about Andrew and what he did. There's not a lot of scripture that talks about Andrew, and we don't know a whole lot about him. At first glance, you would think he was one of these flowers on the wall. 
but he was always in attendance. He was Peter's plus one. If they were a yearbook of these disciples, it would be this picture of this big burly man saying, Simon the Rock, son of Jonah. And next to it would be a picture of this nondescript man that said, Simon's brother. Or maybe not even a picture. Maybe just a scripture. Andrew doesn't take up our whole peripheral vision like some of the other brothers, like John, Peter, and James, the disciples that Jesus would end up loving. Here's a few famous scenes that I'd like to share with you. In Luke, there's a very exciting time when Jesus tells Peter to cast into the deep waters. You know, Peter had been out fishing all night. And he was skeptic when Jesus told him to do this. But he pulled in this big cache of fish. And then Peter throwing himself at Jesus and telling him to get away from him. I am a sinful man. Andrew was there. In John 6, the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus fed thousands on a humble lunch. And Andrew was the one who found the little boy with the Humble lunch, snack lunch. At the triumph entry, there was some Greeks there that's wanting to speak with the new rabbi. But they were Gentiles. But Andrew introduced them anyway. At the Last Supper, when Jesus was explaining the hearts of the gospel to his disciples and washed their feet, Andrew was there also. Andrew had the privilege of being in the frame in a whole lot of stuff. But he don't jump right out at you. He's back in the corner. But we can still learn a lot from this man of faith. This humble man. This quiet man. Humble faith. As we talked earlier, Andrew was one of the first. He was the first disciple that we have recorded record of. Of Jesus' disciples. The Greek Orthodox Church, who used, who loved to give nicknames for everybody, called him, and I'll let you say it for yourself. I tried saying that and tried saying that, and I never could say it. I'll tell you what it means. There you go. There you go. Whatever. But anyway, it means first follower. In John 1, 35 and 39, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. Then he saw Jesus passing by and he said, Look, the Lamb of God. I know several of the songs that was sung this morning was talking about the Lamb. I thought, well, these are going to go right along with my sermon. And then two of the disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day that afternoon with him. It was about four in the afternoon. So we can see that they spent the day with Jesus. You know, Andrew... He was the first disciple. He was a follower of John the Baptist. He had already followed, started following John the Baptist. In those times, you would have people, you would have disciples following people like John the Baptist. Because John, he had this, John, he had this big poetic voice, you know. He was pretty big in the world back then. But John, he knew that there was something new going to happen. He knew the old was going to go out. And he knew this world was never going to be the same again. He knew that Jesus was going to come on the scene. Amen. Amen. One of the great things that we see about John the Baptist is his humility. You know, as we look at the recorded history, John the Baptist had this much bigger following than Jesus at the time. But when John sees Jesus... 
he says that he must increase it, increase. Jesus must increase, and I must decrease. We don't know much of his dialogue, but we know that John the Baptist was always pointing to Jesus and Jesus' ministry. Andrew was the first. He had watched what was going on all the time. His brother, he had watched his brother. His brother took care of the boat. <coughs> Excuse me. Took care of the boat and everything. But Andrew, he was taking care of his needs plus the need of his people because he knew there was something new going to happen. You know, him and John knew that there was something more than just them. And they knew that Jesus was coming. And, you know, it's funny that uh, out of all the disciples, John, or Andrew, Jesus didn't surprise him when he said, come and follow me. You know, they were fishermen. They were there fishing. Jesus comes along and tells them, come, follow me, and I'll make fishermen, I'll make fishermen of, <laughs> of men out of you. Thanks for getting it out there. I had it up here, but I couldn't get it out right there. So He was already following John the Baptist, Andrew, and he was real serious at his following. So he was so serious that when John said, look, the, the Lamb of God is coming, that Andrew just started following Jesus right off the bat. He didn't follow John anymore. John 1, 37, 39. And when the two disciples had heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent the day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. I love this. Jesus Christ, the creator of the world, was spending time with his disciples. Just tell them, come on in. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing if he walked up to you and said, just come on in? Sit down here, boy. I want to tell you a few things. Oh, I'd love to hear that. It'd be wonderful. This is just a simple story. Of Jesus spending time. God himself. The creator of the world. Sat down. And spent time. You know. Somebody had. He had walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. But now. He just simply had time to sit there. With his disciples. And be with the people he loved. Will this be our first. Entrance into the presence. Of Christ himself. just waiting and just watching us wanting to simply break bread with us what a wonderful day that's going to be you know before all the fanfare of heaven before all the angels and all the saints you have this simple meal with the creator himself don't that just blow your mind? Here we are, filthy humans. We'll be able to sit down and have a meal with God himself. Amen. It's going to be wonderful. Andrew, you know, he wasn't a great speaker. He wasn't a great miracle worker. But Andrew was known for being there. For being there. And showing humble faith. Faith. And being there to see Jesus when no one else. You know that faith is a big word. Without faith, we don't have love. We don't have grace. We don't have hope. Without faith, we have nothing. You know, I've got faith that Jesus Christ is waiting on me. I got faith that he created everything that I can see. He created us. It tells me right there in the Bible. I have faith 
that he done all this. He created all this here for us. He's created it all. And that faith, it comes before love. It comes before grace. It comes from my hope. Because i got to have that hope. And i got to have that faith. And i got to have that love. i got to have it. And as old saying is, I want me some of that. We look at another time when Andrew has a speaking line. John 6, 5 through 6. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than a half year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another one of the disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small lo barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go? You know, what, how did I get to there? No, no, but anyway, here we see that Philip's discipleship journeyed right along with Andrew's. But Philip failed the test. Philip scoffed at the idea. He wrote the whole thing off from the very beginning. But then you have Andrew, the one who shows the spark of faith. Since that first day when Jesus was walking on the beach, he had already started following John the Baptist. Andrew had that faith. You know Andrew, Simon Peter's little brother. He always has to be reintroduced as Simon's brother. Anytime you're going to mention Andrew, you have to say Simon's brother, Andrew. It has to be. And Andrew is the seed of faith, but he always has to be introduced. Still waters run deep. If it wasn't for Peter, the church would have never been established. But it, if it wasn't for little brother Andrew showing up and being there, it never would have survived. Amen. Amen. If you take a look at the church's history, we can see the influence of those two men. Peter's ministry became the Roman Catholic Church. Out of that come the Protestant Church. And out of that come a tiny bulb called GCI. So we can see that these men had a big influence on where we're at today. But the Eastern Orthodox claim Andrew as their founder. These two very different brothers that God was using among billions of people to found his church here on earth. Andrew, the little brother of Simon, he was a quiet man of faith. He didn't have a lot to say. He didn't want the glory. He didn't want to be on the stage, but he wanted to be there to see what God had to say. He wanted to be there because he was strong and silent and steady in keeping the faith. Amen. Amen. The last place we see of Andrew mentioned by name is in the upper room in Jerusalem after Jesus has descended into heaven. From there we see the twelve. They show up in many places. And we can assume that Andrew was one of them because all we have is recorded record that he was there, he was present, but he was not forthcoming. He never did. After Andrew and the disciples, the history of the disciples is quite murky. Without a few eyewitnesses, rumors, and no doubt complete myth about what happened to them next to an ocean liner of scripture, ancient history is nothing more than a shaky raft but we hope we got faith that there was something to it. We have faith 
that these two men that God used to start his church, that we are here today, we got that faith. And we're going to get that love. We've got that love because Jesus Christ, he died for us out of that love so that we could be with him to have that meal when the time comes when we can sit there and talk with Jesus. What an awesome day it's going to be. The tradition says Andrew traveled to Greece where he had some of a, he had a successful ministry there. He was a known figure. A local governor's wife became deathly ill. Andrew goes and prays for her. And she rises from her bed healed. Soon after, she leaves her husband to go to the Christian community to spend time with her new faith, working with the community. And boy, this makes the governor mad. I mean, he was fuming. So he was going to get back at Andrew. And he says Andrew was took to the seashore to hang on a cross. As he walked towards the weapon of execution, he said, oh, hell to cross, take me to my master. He was not nailed. They used ropes to hang him there so that he would have exposure to the elements to prolong his death and so that wild dogs could eat him. He wanted to be in the X shape. He didn't want to be in the traditional shape because he said he wasn't worthy to die as Jesus had died. You know, there's a large crowd had gathered there. They wanted to save him because of the miracles they'd seen in his ministry. But he tells them, no, do not save me from my martyrdom. I want to suffer for Christ. He hung on the cross, this quiet man of word. He hung there and he preached the gospel for two days. Then after the crowd finally got to the governor, he said he would spare him. And as he was cutting him down, a blinding light came and Andrew died. There's several different stories of that. So, you know, uh, that's the one that I went with. I mean, you can Google it for yourself if you want to look at different things, you know. What can we learn from this silent man, Andrew, our strong and silent brother. What can we learn from this man who didn't want to take the stage? He didn't want to, you know, speak up, didn't want to fame. But this man was there at the end, preaching the gospel Amen. to his belief. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come to you today. We thank you for being here. We thank you for all the many blessings that you give us. We know without that faith, without that hope, without that love, none of this could be possible. We know that you love us dearly, and we know but what's said in the Bible, that one day we will be with you. We truly believe that what you did 2,000 years ago, that you will come back for us when the time is right. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
just 